The following resource is from DesiringGod.org. Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, in keeping them is great reward. My goal this morning and then tonight is to put you in touch with the ministry of God in the sky and the ministry of God in the scriptures. I think it might be a helpful way to remember the content of Psalm 19 by noting that the first six verses are about the ministry of God through the sky. And then the next um, verses through number 11, I believe, is about the ministry of God through the scriptures. And as I was trying to get on beam with what God wanted me to say this morning, my sense was that he simply wanted me to use the ministry of my word to put you in touch with the ministry of his word through the sky. Now, there is a ministry that God has for you through the sky, sun, moon, stars, clouds, Blue expanse, firmament, that old-fashioned word that describes the arched blue dome that looks like it sits on the circle of the earth. There's a ministry that God has for you through the sky. I believe that's what this text is all about. The ministry from his heart to your heart mediated through the sky. And it's a very neglected ministry. In America, I believe... Among people who are urban, fast-paced, productive, efficient, technological, scientific, we do not very well avail ourselves of the ministry of God through the sky. And that's what I want to talk about this morning and then finish it tonight. I believe with all my heart, and I'll give you a lot of practical, personal evidences from people's lives tonight, That God heals, gives hope, gives happiness, and gives humility through the sky for people who look and listen. Now this morning, what we want to do is just open these first six verses to see what the content of the ministry is. And tonight, get more practical and ask about how do you Get it. How does it work? How do you avail yourself of that ministry that is coming to you through the sky? So let's turn now to verses one to six of Psalm 19. And I have five observations. They're very obvious, I think, except maybe for one of them, which is the one I'm most excited about, probably the last one. But you follow me now, and I'll try to point them out from the text and unfold them briefly. The first observation is that this text has to do with what you see when you look up, not out or down. This text has to do with what you see when you look up, not indoors, by the way. 
but out there. When you go out and you look up, that's what this text is about. The blue, the white, the yellow, the lavender and gold when it's early or late in the day. That's what this text is all about. The heavens, that's what I'm pausing on, the word heavens. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament declares his handy work. Now, I don't think, make a little correction and avoid a possible under, misunderstanding here. I don't think David, by focusing on what you see when you look up, is saying that the ocean or the trees or the animals or the wind or the earth or the flowers don't speak about God. He's not saying that. They do. Everything that God made speaks. And since God never speaks in vain, everything ministers if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Everything ministers because everything speaks God and God is a ministry. God heals. God gives hope. God gives happiness. God gives humility in and through everything that he has made. But this first point is simply to draw your attention to the fact that for some reason, David is most excited here about what he sees when he looks up. Second point, what you see when you look up outdoors speaks. That's the second point. It tells, it proclaims. You see those verse, those verbs. But here's the verb I like best in verse two. Day unto day, what is it? Pours forth speech. Now I looked that verb up in Hebrew just to check it out. And it is a very exciting word. It means gush forth, spew out knowledge and speech. So fix this truth very firmly in your minds. Every time the sun rises, or every time the stars come up, or every time the thunder rolls and the lightning strikes, every time there is a lavender, gold, yellow sunrise or sunset, God is gushing forth speech to you. And he means for you to hear it. And he means for you to be ministered to by it. He means for you to be helped by it. Do you believe God speaks in vain? Do you believe God speaks without love? Do you believe he just rambles on with no purpose like some people do? No. Whenever God speaks, every word is designed for your good. And so the second point is simply, when you look up, God is speaking to you. And we need to learn to hear him. We need to learn to interpret and be helped by what he's saying. Third point. The message comes without words, without speech, without voice. Now, this is this is. Difficult, because most of us are so word dependent, I am, that thinking of something coming from God's heart to my heart minus words is very difficult. And that's what's happening when you look up. Something is being communicated from God's mind and heart to your mind and heart without any vehicle of language. No reasonings. No arguments, no words. Now, the, you can tell how hard this is because David has to use paradox to get it across. Look at, look at the paradox between verses 2 and 3. Verse 2 says, day to day pours forth speech. Then look at verse 3. There is no speech. Now, you, you talk like that. That's the same Hebrew word, by the way. There's no different word there, no fancy meaning. Same thing in English that it is in Hebrew. Speech is being poured forth. And there is no speech. You get it? It's not easy to get. We're not good at it. I'm not good at it. Getting messages from God, not through words, but through light, Color 
shape, contrast, proportion, design, magnitude, and a lot of other things I'm sure I can't think of that make up what the eye inhales when it looks up. So the third point is that God is communicating without words, without voice, without speech. And yet, verse 4 goes right back to verse 2 and says, yet their line, that may be written line, may be plumb line, sound, voice. There's a lot of uncertainty about what that word means, but we get the idea. Their line goes out through all the earth. And their words, there it is, hey, I thought there were no words. Well, there aren't, but there are. Words to the end of the world. Wordless words, speechless speech, voiceless voice. From God's heart to your heart to minister healing and wholeness and happiness and humility and hope. Are you good at it? You get it? Or are you too busy even to look up? And listen. Point number four, the message that comes without words through the sky is about God. Day and night, everywhere in the world, God is speaking about God. You see it in verse one. The heavens are telling the glory of God. We are not pantheists. Let's get this real clear. I I thought as I prepared this message that some New Agers would come in here and say, Oh, right on, man. Listen to the nature, right? (laughs) Yeah, as I hear it, woo. (laughs) We are not New Age pantheists. In the beginning, God... Who always was without nature, full and complete in his triune happiness, said, let there be nature. And there was nature. And it is not God. We are not pantheists. We believe in God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We are light years away from the kind of being that the new age puts forth, calling all God. Nevertheless, I'm going to say what the Bible says. Nature tells us about God. God is speaking through nature about himself. Now, let me step back and use an illustration about a painting here, because there are two things in particular that I think come home to the human heart visually without any mediated language or medium of language. Well, let's use a painting to illustrate this. When you are shown a painting, a person, landscape, um, flower, two things are immediately in your mind. You don't have to think about it. Nobody has to give a lecture about it. They are there. Number one, in your mind immediately is this reality. This is a painting, not a flower. This is a portrait, not a person. This is a landscape painted, not a a landscape that I could walk through. This is, in other words, a work of someone's hands, a work of someone's mind, a designer. That's there. It's just boom. It's there. You don't finish it. Hmm. Now, is that a real flower or not? It's just there when you are shown a painting. Now, here's the second thing that comes right home to your heart and mind without any mediation of argumentation or words. An assessment. You say immediately, this is ugly, or this is beautiful, or this is lewd, or this is frightening, or this is blah. Something is, boom, right there in your mind by way of assessment. You feel it. Now, let's go back and just relate this to nature, God's painting, and see how this happens. You 
look up into the sky and you are shown of the sun, the broad expanse of blue, maybe an arrangement of clouds, maybe a glorious sunrise or sunset. And two things happen, I believe, immediately without any argumentation or extended rational, logical uh, development, without any words. Number one, you know this was made. This was made. And no evolutionary speculation to the contrary can shake loose the deep, primal, intuitive, normal, ordinary perception. This was made. These stars were made. This little spider who carries air to the bottom of the lake and fills his little net. Remember I talked about this three years ago? This crazy spider who gets Air does a somersault on top of the water, goes to the bottom of the lake, puts the bubble under his little uh, cocoon, goes back, gets another one so he can live down there. Crazy. This is crazy. This is God's sense of humor. <laughs> Everybody looks and there comes home a native sense. These things are a painting. They are not the painter. These things are a design. They are not the designer. These things were made. And the second thing that comes home is glory. This is beautiful. This is glorious. This is awesome. This is big. My, oh my, what must be behind this creation? There were mornings. On the study leave, the cottage was at the bottom of the hill and about 20 or 30 yards into the woods was this little trailer where I sat most of the days working on this book that I was working on. And mornings I would uh, walk and I would just stop about halfway in the woods. And I would look down through the pine trees, probably 80, 100 years old, to the little four-acre lake that's down there, and I would see the sun spangled with those diamonds dancing across the water. You know how it does on the lake in the morning. And then I would begin to look up. It's about nine. The sun's about at this angle, just blazing through. And there's the shield of hickory and oak and sweet gum and maple leaves all doing like this in the breeze. And they're all yellow, green, and gold. And then I looked on up, and there was the big, broad, expanse expanse of blue and the cool morning breeze was hitting me in the face and all I could do was say glory, glory, glory. And I didn't reason it out either. I didn't lecture myself. It was just there. It's just there. When you open your eyes to see what God has done, you see glory. The glory of God is not something that can be transferred merely by words. It is transferred by words in the gospel, by gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit, by the scriptures and by the skies. But it is only being transferred. The glory of God is always something more than sky. It's always something more than scripture. It's always something more than gifts and fruit of the Holy Spirit. The glory of God is tasted by spiritual perception within. It is perceived by the gift of God's revelation. It is an awesome thing to behold the glory of God in the sky. Now, let me sum up these four points, and then I have one more to make, the one that I'm most excited about. First point. What this text is dealing with in these six verses is what you see when you look up the skies. Second point, these skies are pouring forth speech. Every day, every night, everywhere in the world to everybody. Third point, the speech is without speech. The words are without words. The voice is without voice. And the medium from God's heart to your heart is what you see. And the fourth point is it's all about God. It's not about nature. It's about God. I say again and again and again, I want us to have a God-centered church. 
Here's just another piece of the puzzle, folks. Are we God-centered when we look up? Are we God-centered when we hit the water on a cool day? Are we God-centered when we take walks? Are we God-centered when we pull weeds? Are we God-centered in His world? His world is gushing forth God to us. Now, here's the last point. The glory of God is a very happy thing. The glory of God is a very happy thing. I get this from verses 5 and 6. I've spent a lot of time in these verses over the study break. I've enjoyed them perhaps more than any other verses. You don't have to agree with me that they came into being in this way, but I want to paint a little picture for you how they might have come into being. David gets up early. He's in Mount Zion. Um, maybe he walks out on the roof of his house, or maybe he just goes outside the walls of the city, strolls. It's not quite sunrise yet. He looks out over the Jordan Valley from Mount Zion and waits. And gradually the black turns to gray and the blade gray to deep blue. And then there's this seam of light and then there's lavender and gold and red mingled together. It's changing shapes and he's waiting. And then you get the lip of this magnificent sun. And it rises until he can't look at it anymore in its brightness. And the Holy Spirit comes upon David and inspires him to put down these two verses in such a way so that we will know and feel what the glory of God is like gushing forth from the sun. What is the glory of God like when it gushes forth in speech from the rising sun? And he says, it is like a bridegroom coming forth out of his chamber. It is like a strong man who runs his race with joy. Its rising is from the end of heavens and its setting and circuit to the end of them. And nothing is hid from its heat. Now, why did he say that? That's what I've been asking myself again and again. What's the deal with the bridegroom and the runner? I think... It's not merely because the bridegroom is always decked out in a tuxedo or fine robes. It's not merely that he's often surrounded by noble groomsmen who are also arrayed in exciting clothes and beaming in their faces. I think the reason the glory of God gushing forth from the sun is like a bridegroom coming forth from his chamber on his wedding day is that this is the happiest day of his life. I think it's because this is the fulfillment of so many dreams. I think it's because this is the beginning of such a kind of joy that he anticipates. And God wants you to feel that's the way the glory of God is. God wants you this morning, when you walk out of here, to look up and feel what is gushing forth from the skies on October 26th at midday is the glory of God, which is like the happiest day of my life, whatever it was. It's like the fulfillment of all of my dreams. It's like the beginning of the best vacation I could ever take that might never end. That's what the glory of God is like. But he didn't stop with his bridegroom, as good as that is. He went on to an image. Why did he think of this? I mean, of all the images of joy in the world that you could think of, would you have thought of a runner running with all his might? I suppose the reason it meant so much to me is because I ran a lot on, on study leave. I run... 12, 15 miles a week, which may not be a lot for some of you runners, but for me it was a lot. I ran three mornings a week, about four miles. It feels good to run. I was in a, a worship service in Griffin, Georgia, and the preacher stood up and he said, I don't jog. I've never seen anybody jog that enjoys. I almost stood up. 
he, he, he actually said, anybody out there who's ever seen a jogger that enjoys jogging, I raised my hand right in the middle of the sanctuary. It's like this. And the guy was going to pull my hand down. <laughs> Why else run? But I'll tell you the scene I'll bet most of you would remember. If I asked you, what's the most memorable running scene you've ever seen? Which one shouted glory, glory better than any scene you've ever seen of a runner? I wonder how many of you would say the last lap of the last race in Chariots of Fire with Eric Little. I can see it. He's got his hand gripped around that note. He who honors me, I will honor. And he's coming around that last bend and his arms begin to pump like living pistons. His head goes back into that utterly unorthodox running position. Every muscle in his body is doing just what he's supposed to do. The smile breaks over his face. And everything in the scene cries, glory, does to me anyway. And it must have to David. Glory. I remember the closest thing I've experienced to that was the morning after I finished the book on the study leave. I finished what I was working on, by the way. And it felt so good to finish. And I knew the next day I didn't have to go out there and sit in that hot little trailer and watch my kids go swimming. (laughs) So I got up the next morning. I put on my Etonic running shoes and my bathing suit, which I run in, and my T-shirt, my pro-life T-shirt. And I headed out down this long road. Noel said there's a lake out there somewhere. I'd run down that road every morning for a long time. I couldn't get to that lake. I'm going to reach that lake this morning. I just kept running. And my whole body lifted my hand. I was charismatic over and over again, just like this. I was running. I was just running like this. I'd pass people. I'd go like this. It's finished. It's finished. You know, glory, glory. I was running down the road till I got to that lake. And I stopped at that lake. And I remembered it from years ago. Noel and I had gone to that lake once while we were courting. And I just stopped there. And my heart was so full of glory. I think that's something about what David is trying to get across here. Even though you may not have the strength to run, you all have an imagination of the day that's coming when all your muscles are going to work just the way they were supposed to work when you were in your prime. All of your ligaments and tendons are going to be right. All of your organs are going to be whole and live. All your mind and all your emotions will be freed from depression and discouragement and fretting and fear and guilt. And everything's going to come together and work exactly right. And you're going to bolt with cartwheels in the kingdom. And God just wants to say through David and through the sun and the clouds and the sunrise and the sunset and the thunder and lightning, that's the way my glory is. And that's what heals. That's what lifts burdens. That's what makes hopeful and happy. And I want to talk tonight about how it happens. Now, I want to close in prayer. And there are two kinds of people I want to pray for. And I just ask you to bow your head with me and join me in prayer about these two kinds of people. There's some of each kind here, I believe. And the first kind is people who have never seen the glory of God. Let's just pray for them right now. They've looked up and they've seen the sky. They maybe have read scripture. They may have heard the gospel. They may have seen fruits of the spirit in people's lives. Maybe even tasted some wonder of God. And they've never seen the glory. They've never tasted the spiritual taste of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, crucified for sinners and risen again, and they are not saved. And I want us to pray that the light of God would dawn in their hearts and that they would behold the glory of God. And the second kind of person is the Christian who hasn't seen the glory for a long time. The sky had been so clouded over And the thickness of it has been so great that all they've been able to do is hold fast to the former conviction. The sun is there somewhere, but I don't see it. And I want to pray for them. Father, 
I pray that you'd save sinners this morning who've never seen your glory, who've looked up and have never gotten beyond the sun or the sky or the firmament or the clouds or the sunrise or the thunder or the lightning. They've never heard the word within the word, the voice within the voice. Would you come right now, cause them to be born again, give them that spiritual taste, and when they walk out, may the evidence that they have been born of God be that they see what they've never seen before in the sky. And this afternoon, may they open their Bibles and see what they've never seen before in the Scriptures. May they look at your people and see what they've never seen before in the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And may they come back tonight and not need what I have to say, because it will already be a reality in their lives. And then I pray for your people. You allow, Lord, dark seasons to come for your holy purposes. You also ordain their end. And I believe that you are calling some people to exit the cloudy night this morning. And I pray that you would, by your powerful Holy Spirit right now, blow away the clouds that you would come with fresh vision. And as those people walk out of this room into this day, there might be again the glory that they once knew. We unite our hearts to pray this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource from DesiringGod.org. If you found it helpful, We encourage you to enjoy and share from thousands of resources on our site, including books, sermons, articles, and more, available free of charge. DesiringGod.org exists to help you treasure Jesus more than anything else, because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.